So for all of the children, before you go to Children's Church, before you go to Children's Church, all the children meet me down here at the altar. So all the children meet me down here at the altar. Come on, it's all right. Come on, we, I'm not going to bite you. Come on down. Matter of fact, I'm going to come on down here with you. How y'all doing? Hey, Amen. Man, you look so wonderful. Oh, well, how you doing? Well, praise the Lord. Somebody give God a praise for our babies. Hey, Amen. Well, I know we don't talk to y'all much in the big church. But tonight is a special occasion because the Lord has a word for you before you head back to the children's church. Amen. So tonight, y'all get the y'all are the first partakers of the word of God. Because we're talking from Ephesians, and Ephesians says, so let me take a question here. How many of you want to live a long life? Raise your hand. Right? We all want to live a long life. And how many of you want God to give you good things? Amen? Raise your hand. You want God to bless you? Okay. Well, here's how that can happen. Because Paul says, children, that's all of you, children, obey your parents. Now, that means you do what your parents tell you to do, even when you get on the, they get on your nerves. I already know they get on your nerves. But the Bible says that we obey our parents. That is part of how God is going to give you a long life. And he says, obey your parents in the Lord, meaning that God is going to help you obey your parents. So I want you to repeat after me. Say, Lord, I can't hear you. Lord, help me obey my parents. You're not talking. Open up your mouth. I see you over there. Now say it again. Say, Lord, help me obey my parents again. Lord, help me obey my parents. Amen. Because God, he helps us to do certain things in the Lord. And so the next part says is that honor your father and your mother. Now, you know what honor means? Now, honor means if your parents tell you something to do, you don't talk back. Honor means when your parents tell you to do something, you don't go off in your room and slam the door and start mumbling. What was that? Nothing. I know. I already know. Honor your parents mean you don't say bad things about your parents to your friends at school. Now, if you do all those things, God says, I will give you a long life and that it will be well with you in the land. Meaning God is going to bless you. So we got one more thing we got to say. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. Say, I will, I will. Honor, honor my parents. My parents. Again, I will, I will. Honor, honor my parents. Now, in the old church, they said it was one for the Father, two for the Son. So this last one is for the Holy Ghost. Are you ready? Yes. Say, I will, I will. Honor, honor my parents. My parents. Praise the Lord. To God be the glory. Now, I want to pray for you before you guys go back. So I'm going to have the whole church just point your hands toward these children. And we're going to pray a word of blessing over them. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these gifts of God that you have placed in the hands of these parents, Lord God. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would help them to obey their parents, that you would help them to honor their father and their mother, Lord God. And Father, I pray that these children who are the holders of dreams, Lord God, they're the ones who are holders of the next anointings that are going to come. These are our next CEOs. These are our next pastors. These are our next businessmen. These are our next songwriters, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you would bless them right now from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. 
Lord God, I pray you would surround them with your grace and with your mercy and raise them up, Father, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for them. Continue to watch over them and to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Now clap your hands and give God a praise. All right. Now y'all give me a high five on the way out. Uh, 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 uh. All right, y'all can go. Praise God. Give me five, brother. All right, give me one. Give me some. Give me some. There you go. All right. Y'all can go to Children's Church now. God bless you, brother. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, brother, man. Thank you. Hallelujah. In verse 4 in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And if you read that in the King James, it says, admonition of the Lord. So that is the responsibility of the parents. And we are not to overdo it in terms of instruction and discipline with our children because we don't want to be domineering to cause um, discouragement because God is watching parents too. And he will deal with you swiftly if you abuse his children. They belong to him before you ever got here, before you, they were ever born, and they'll be his long after you're gone. And so as parents, we are to be just stewards over God's children. And God tells you how to raise his children. And so he says we don't provoke them to anger. We bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And I'll finish that part here just in a second. And by the way, we are wrapping up Ephesians chapter 6. I hit the ground running this this evening. So we are wrapping up Ephesians chapter 6. And Ephesians can be broken up into really three sections. It starts off with the wealth of the believer. All the things that God has invested in us. Then it goes through the walk of the believer. So that's what we're finishing up right now. And then we're going to go into the warfare of the believer. Now we get down to further along in this particular chapter. But for those who are raising children, have a couple of questions for you. If you are a parent, do you read the Bible to your children? If you are a parent, do you pray for and with them daily? If you are a parent, do you take them to worship and Bible study groups and let them see how important your involvement in church is to you? If you are a parent, can they see the difference Christ makes in your life? Now, that last one can be a little bit challenging, depends on the age and when you got saved. Um, when I was, my children were little, I had a little children's Bible, and you would read the little children's story, and at the end of it, it had a part where the parent would tell something about the child. And believe me, my daughter couldn't wait to get to that part. She couldn't wait because part of it was your issues and your challenges and how you overcame them. So if you aren't telling your children how you overcame, it will encourage them and how they too can overcome because they too are going to go through trials and tribulations. So don't be stingy with your testimony. Share how you overcame with your children so that they too can have a witness and someone to talk to and say, well, mommy and dad got over that. If mom and dad, if God's seen them through the storms, then that gives them encouragement that God will get them through as well. So part of what we do is also share our testimony with our children. So now let's jump down into the next verse here. And Paul starts this conversation talking about bond servants and masters, right, or slaves and masters. And I thought it would be important to highlight how slavery back in the ancient world of the Greco-Roman world is not the same as the slavery we know that happened here in the United States. So I have some list of information here on the Roman institution of being a bond servant because there are some differences that we want to take a look at. 
before we read uh, verse 5. It says, slavery in Rome was not based on race or ethnicity. So anybody could have been a bond servant or a slave during this period of time. And it says, slaves generally were permitted to work for pay and to save enough to buy their freedom. A lot of times they were bond servants by choice because they got into debt and they couldn't pay it back. And so sometimes they would voluntarily go into bond servanthood in order to pay back a debt. Sometimes they were born into it, so there's various reasons, but oftentimes you had an opportunity to work off your debt and to regain your freedom. Thirdly, slaves were entrusted with immense amounts of money and responsibilities, such as overseeing the children's education. Sometimes they were tutors. So if you are educating the master's children, that means you yourself had to have been educated. And so also, slaves were often were considered members of the household in Greco-Roman culture. And in the New Testament, it assumes that human trafficking is a sin. Even though during this time period there was human trafficking, it was not something that God approved of. And so those are just some of the differences between then and then what happened here in the United States. And what was happening at the time, because bond servants were, there were millions of them in the first century church era. And so what you had, you had these masters and you had slaves now getting saved. So what do you do now when both are Christians, both are part of the body of Christ? How does that relationship now work? And so that's what Paul is describing here because of uh, bond service has such a significant part of this Greco-Roman society. So in verse 5, it says, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Verse 7 says, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this, is, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. So Paul is saying that do everything as unto the Lord. You don't do it to please people. That's what it says, I service or people pleasers. You're not doing it trying to get notice. Whatever your lot is in this life, you do it as unto the Lord. And then in verse 9, it says, Masters, do the same to, to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in, is ma their master and yours in heaven, and that there is no partiality with them. And so he has a word for the masters about not threatening them because essentially they had control of their lives even back then. It says they are not to abuse them because both report to God. Whether you are a bond servant or a master, both have a master and that is God. And so think about it on your job between a, a CEO or someone who is an employee. Both are saved. Both have masters. God doesn't favor one or the other. He has no partiality, right? The Bible in the King James says no respecter of person. And so because everybody reports to God. And so you notice here that Paul doesn't tell those who are bond service to go try to get your freedom, try to force your way out, start a riot and overthrow. He says, no, stay where you are because if you obey the Lord and continue to do good, you serve as unto to the Lord, he says, even then in that situation, God will still bless you. You see, God does not always have to get you out of situations to bless you. Oftentimes, he can bless you. He also can grant you favor right where you are. Just look at the life of Joseph. He's a perfect example of somebody who went from the pit to the palace, and God granted him favor on every level. So no matter where you are in life, no matter if you are frustrated with your job, no matter if you are frustrated with your business, God can still bless you if you do what the Word said to do. And if we do everything as unto the Lord. 
And if we do everything as unto the Lord, then God will pay you according to your faithfulness to his word. Amen? All right, well, we'll get a part of the message here that I'm just fired up about because that concludes the walk of the believer. So we started with the welfare, the, um, the wealth of the believer, the first part of Ephesians, about the chapter 4. And then we start talking about marriage. You start talking about uh, family and bond service, where Paul is still walking through the walk of the believer. And so now he goes into the warfare of the believer. Now, when it comes to spiritual warfare, we normally have two camps. You have those who underemphasize spiritual warfare, meaning they deny the reality of the demonic realm, or they just have never studied it, don't pay attention to it, they don't think it's real, or they just have their head in the sand and just ignore it altogether. Then you have those who overemphasize spiritual warfare, and everything is caused by a demon. The devil trying to steal my house. No, you bought a house you couldn't afford. And eventually, it caught up to you, and the mortgage company is not the devil. They just want their money. But you have these two swings that kind of go back and forth. But as believers, we want balance. Somebody say balance. We don't want to swing too far to underemphasizing. We don't want to swing so far where we're overemphasizing. And now you're spending all your money going to deliverance conferences. And now you walk out so fired up, you looking for a devil to fight with. Or you're way over here and you underemphasize it and you ignore demonic activity. We can't be that wide a swing. What we want is to be balanced and in the middle of this particular conversation. But I tell you what, if I had to pick one side or the other, I will pick the overemphasizers seven days a week and twice on Sunday. Because when it comes to spiritual warfare, I know they in the fight. I know they are battle ready and they are tested. You got to calm them down. But I know one thing, if a devil did rise up, I know them folk over there. It's easier to calm people down than to pump them up. And if I got somebody on fire and they chasing devils all over Tampa, I said, look, bro, just calm down. Just settle down. But at least I know one thing. I know that they are in the spiritual fight. Because in this day and age, we cannot underemphasize Satan and the devil's activity because it is real. And the Bible tells us to give no opportunity to the devil. And so, how many of you remember, this was back in the 1800s, there you know, these two families who hated each other, I think around Kentucky, West Virginia, called the Hatfields and the McCoys. Now, the Hatfields hated the McCoys, and the McCoys hated the Hatfields, and they were killing each other, this big family feud. Because, and if you were born a Hatfield, you automatically hated the McCoys. And if you were born a McCoy, you automatically hated the Hatfields. Well, when you were born again, you have a natural spiritual enemy. By virtue of being a child of God, we ought to hate every demonic activity there is in the world today. So we have a natural, a spiritual enemy. There is a real devil to fight. And whether you realize it or not, you are in the army of the Lord. And this world is so crazy, we need all hands on deck. We still want balance, though. We still want, we still want that balance. And so we're going to go into this warfare of the believer. Uh, The warfare of the believer. So in the letter's final teaching section, Paul instructs believers to stand against the evil forces at work in the world. This discussion has three parts. A description of the nature of the battle in 10 through 13. A call to resist the powers by putting on the armor of God and a reminder to pray 
and be alert. So let's go ahead down to verse 10. And it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on half the armor. Put on a third of the armor. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And so that word whole armor in the Greek refers to the complete equipment of a fully armed soldier. And that word schemes is methods or craftiness because the demonic world is slick. It is crafty. They have methods. They studied man for thousands of years. The same devils you read about in the Bible are still here today because they haven't had the final judgment yet. So they're still um, causing havoc in the world. So we know that the plans and schemes of the devil is like a military operation. And they are very strategic in what it is that they are trying and attempting to do. Now, the pulpit commentary says this, for life is a battlefield, not a scene of soft enjoyment and ease, but of hard conflict with foes within and without. And so this is the life of the believer, is that we have an enemy that is very much strategic. And the Bible tells us that in 1 Peter 5 and 8, is that the devil prowls around, right, looking for those that he can devour. Now, how many of you remember those um, Animal Kingdom shows or those animal shows where they show that lion and he has that prey in his sight? And he's all squanched down. He's, he's looking real intently. And he'll peek behind the tall grass and he'll peek back over here. And he's watching and he's looking for a weakness in that particular animal. And when he sees it, he start, he'll start crouching. He'll start, I mean, they are so smooth with it. I mean, he'll wick up that one leg and oh, he'll, he'll dart back under that tall grass. And as soon as that animal is available, as soon as he breaks away from the pack, or he'll pick one of the weaker ones, then that devil would go and attack. Don't think for a second the Satan and his demons aren't watching us. They are watching this church. They are watching our leaders. They are looking out at your house because they hate the church. And they want to stop the purposes of God from going forth. And so we see that we have this devil who is looking for who he can devour. They're looking for loopholes. They're looking for a weakness over here. They're looking for a crack over here so they can come in and wreak havoc and prevent the purposes of God from going forth. And so as believers, we have to be on guard and we have to be ready to stand in the face of every demonic force. Now, verse 12, it says, for we do not wrestle, which means to struggle or to fight against flesh and blood, because we know that the people who are acting out in our world, who are creating all kind of atrocities, we know that there's a force behind them. And so our fight is not with the person in front of us. It is the fight is with the spirit that's behind them. And it says, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And I call this the SDA. No, not the FDA. This is the SDA, Satan's Demonic Alliance, because the devil has a network. The rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers, the word cosmic powers means world rulers, meaning there is nowhere on the face of the earth that is not affected by demonic influence. Then there are spiritual forces. So he has a network that is at work to go in and try to come against the family of God, to come against the purposes of God. And so he is ruthless in his attempt 
to ruin our witness, to call us to fall, to stop the promise, the promise of God from going forth, to stop the word from going forth, to stop people from being saved. That is their job, is to drag all of things that God has done and try to negate it. And so they have authority and they have some sort of power and they surround the entire world. Now, although this is true according to Paul's account here, we still don't walk around in fear. Because when we look at the wealth of the believer back in Ephesians chapter 1, Verses 19, it says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, And when he ran out of names, he said, and every, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So Jesus on the cross, he defeated the SDA. And he is far above, not barely above, not slightly above, but he is far above everything that is named. And for everybody who is a believer in Christ, we have that assurance that we are covered by the blood of the Lamb because he has delivered us and saved us. And the Bible says we are seated with him in heavenly places in the spiritual realm. And so we don't walk around in darkness. We don't walk around in fear, being scared of the enemy. But at the same time, we don't go around picking a fight either. Right? We're not trying to go and pick a fight with the demonic, but if the devil shows up, we don't run either. We, we stand our ground. Amen? So let's take a look at verse 13. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. So you see Paul mentions that twice here in this chapter, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand firm. So he says, withstand in the evil day and having all to, uh, to stand, to stand firm. That word stand firm means to refuse to change a decision or position. It means you hold your position where you are. And so Paul is getting the believers prepared for battle. He's getting us ready And he's getting us prepared so that on the occasion where we have to resist the enemy, he is about to give us the tools. He's about to give us the insight on how to prepare for this spiritual warfare. And before we get into it, we need to get ourselves ready because nobody fights a battle sitting down. Anybody go to boot camp or go to basic and you sat down the whole time, just in meetings all day for four, no, you was on your feet literally all day getting prepared for battle, getting prepared for the occasion or the happenstance. You have to be put into the theater so that you will be prepared. So we have to be standing up in our spirit. But he says for us to stand firm and refuse to change. Now, I won't have everybody stand on your feet because we are about to get ready for battle, and I can't have you do it sitting down. So get a good, firm grip. I hope you got some good shoes on because we are about to let out a war cry because we have a Savior in Jesus who has defeated every enemy that there is. And we have to let the devil know that we mean business. We are not going to back up. We are not going to punk out, but we are going to stand our ground and we are going to not let the devil have our children, have our church, have our finances, and have our marriage. We are not going to do it. It stops here. So on the count of three, we are going to holler Jesus, and this is going to be our war cry to let the enemy know that we mean business. On the count of three, one, two, three. Jesus! Oh, I think you're ready. I think you're ready. I think the devils are trembling right now. We're going to release, we're going to release another one right now. On the count of three, one, two, 
three, Jesus. Oh, yeah, that was one for the Father. That was one for the Son. Now this next war cry is for the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. And I want to get your, get your family in your mind, get your purpose in your mind. Think about everything the devil has done in your life to try to kill you, to try to destroy you. I want you to get that thing in your mind. And in this last war cry, we're going to let the enemy know from the ends of the earth that we are going to stand our ground on the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus! Now give your God a praise. Hallelujah. Now, your blood's flowing. Your heart's pumping. You might be sweating a little bit like I am. But now you are ready for the fight. Amen? All right, well, if you can, you can have your seat, praise God. So now we're going into the call to resist the powers by putting on the armor of God. So, verse 14. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. And I think I got a graphic. All right, there we go. So it's on the screen. So, so this is, of course, this whole idea of the uh, whole armor of God, the analogy is of a Roman soldier. So we're going to walk through each part of the armor of God. And so first off, we have the belt. And so the leather, uh, the belt was a leather belt, was tied around a wool tunic, uh, connected bronze plates hung from the belt to protect the soldier's groin area, it supports a sword, dagger, and a bronze apron. And here's what I love about this. It was worn at all times, even without other armor pieces. So this belt of truth, and we know that Satan is the father of lies. And that's how he comes at us. And so Satan fights with lies, and sometimes his lies sound like truth, but only believers have God's truth, which can defeat Satan's lies. And so the first thing that we have as believers is that we stand on the truth of who God is. We stand on the truth of his word, and we keep that on no matter what. Matter of fact, just next time you go to bed tonight, go to bed with a belt on, just so you can feel what it's like to have that belt on 24-7. And it is the word of truth. It is the belt of truth. Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, that's the truth, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, that's the truth, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. He died for our sins, that's the truth. He was raised from the dead. That's the truth. If I call upon him and ask him to come into my life and save me, that's the truth. He indwells me right now. That's the truth. I'm covered in his blood. That's the truth. I'm forgiven of my sins. That's the truth. I'm going to heaven one day. That's the truth. I'm blessed. That's the truth. I'm above and not beneath. That's the truth. So we, we wear the truth like a belt. It's our support system. And Ephesians 4.21 says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through him. Jesus is the truth. So that is the first piece of armor that we have to walk in daily is the belt, the belt of truth. The B clause of this verse is, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And I uh, have a picture of that up there as well. And so the breastplate is the iron or bronze scaled armor was built in four sections to cover each shoulder and side of the chest. The plates were sewn to a stiff leather vest 
which was put on like a jacket before the front plates were tied with leather straps. And so your breastplate covered all of your vital organs, right? Your heart, your lungs, arteries, all of your vital organs. And so Satan often attacks our heart, which is the seat of our emotions, self-worth, and trust. God's righteousness is the breastplate that protects our heart and ensures his approval. He approves of us because he loves us and sent his son to die for us. Now, this analogy that Paul is walking through in Ephesians chapter 6 we see the same thing highlighted in, the, in Isaiah chapter 59. So let's run over to Isaiah 59, uh, verse 17. And he's talking about Jesus. And he says, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. So what we are seeing in Ephesians, this is not our armor. We are putting on the armor of Christ because when you gave your life to Christ, an exchange took place. He took your sin and he gave you his righteousness. It was imputed on us and we wear that righteousness like a breast uh, plate. We put on Christ's righteousness. So we don't do it in our own power or authority. We do it because it has been imputed to us. And that righteousness and that holiness protects our heart. It protects our lungs. It protects the things that are vital to us. And so holiness is a protection. We always bore down to rules. You can't do this. You can't do this. But the righteousness of God when you wear that breastplate, it helps you to stay protected from the plans and schemes of the enemy. And if you go off and you take that off and you get off into sin, you've just exposed your heart to the devil. And you don't want your heart exposed. You want to keep on that blessed plate of righteousness. And it reminds me of what happened between Saul and David. Remember, they're going up against Goliath. David shows up, and, and Saul gives David his armor. He gives him his helmet and his sword, and David puts it on, and David's walking like, man, this don't feel right. You know, what is, I can't, I can't work this. He says, no, he says, I, I, can't, I can't do this. And so he gives his armor back to Saul. Well, the issue is Saul and David had a different spirit. Saul sought the heart of the people, and David sought the heart of God. And so in a spiritual context, he couldn't wear Saul's armor. Well, we have Christ indwelling in us. We have the gift of the Holy Ghost inside of us. So therefore, the armor of Jesus fits us perfectly because we have him in us. We have the image of God on the inside of us. We have the indwelling spirit of Jesus. So his armor fits on us perfectly. His grace fits on us perfectly. His mercy fits on us perfectly. His righteousness fits on us perfectly. His anointing fits on us perfectly. As a matter of fact, it looks good on me. Tell your neighbor the armor of God looks good on you because of the nature of Christ that dwells in your spirit. Ha, huh? I'm excited over that one right there. That's my word. I don't know what your word is for tonight, but that one right there is mine. Because of our association and our belief and faith in Christ, that armor is tailor-made for each and every one of us. So you're not putting on something that don't fit. It won't be like David putting on Saul's armor because you're putting on Christ's armor because we are the image of Christ. And so it fits us just right. And Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 says, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So there's Paul's confirmation is that we take off the old man, which is the sinful nature, and we put on the new man, which is the likeness of God. And when you put on that new man, then God says, now my armor will fit on you. 
that helmet, the, the breastplate, the shoes, the sword, all of that now begins to fit. Now verse 15 says, And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So the sandals were thick leather soles embedded with hobnails or bits of rock for increased traction uh, were tied to the feet with numerous leather straps. They were fit for both marching and fighting and became more comfortable with constant wear. Satan wants us to think that telling others the good news is a worthless and hopeless task. However, the shoes that God gives us are the motivation to continue to proclaim the true peace that is available to God, news everyone needs to hear. And so the shoes represent us moving the gospel forward. It's about taking the gospel message out into the world. And the one thing that I learned, because I spent 10 years on the streets doing evangelism, and where it says, become more comfortable with constant wear, when you are out witnessing or telling others about Christ, it strengthens your faith in the gospel. There's a boomerang effect. There is a, a reciprocity that has happened that as you're sharing, it is amazing what God will pour right back into you. And so the more you do it and they have those, those like little cleats on the bottom of their shoes so you gain more traction, your faith begins to grow. You grow spiritually. You grow more bold. And so those shoes are about us going out and being prepared to share the gospel of peace, the good news of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 15 says, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? So that's why you see this analogy of shoes. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. That word beautiful means seasonable or timely. So whenever you bring a word to somebody, whenever you bring the gospel, I guarantee you it's right on time. I don't know what they're, care what they're going through or what's happening. Every time you preach the gospel, it is always on time. Verse 16 says, in all circumstances, pick up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So with the shield, it was, uh, the curve was created using three bonded layers of thin wood strips covered by linen or leather. The shield was painted according to legion. A bronze rim covered the rounded edges as additional protection. And so the overlapping shields allow soldiers to advance together. The shield was used to defend the entire body, including the back. What we see are Satan's attacks in the form of insults, setbacks, and temptations. However, the shield of faith protects us from Satan's fiery arrows. With God's, from God's perspective, we can see beyond our circumstances and know that ultimate victory is ours. Now, the question is, if I have a shield and the shield is made out of leather, how does that extinguish a fiery dart? I'm thinking the shield will catch on fire too, if it's made out of just dried leather. But what the Roman soldiers would do is they would dip the shield in water, and they would soak the shield in water, and so that way when the fiery darts come, now they're able to be extinguished. So the shield of faith is dipped in water. So if you take your faith, and you dip it in the Holy Ghost. Then when you bring it up, everything the devil tries to shoot your way will be extinguished. And let me ask you this question. What is easier to deal with, a fiery dart or a blazing inferno? See, what most people do is we have a lot of Christians that have no armor, and the fiery darts come. Now their whole house is on fire, and now they're calling the church to have a counseling session. Well, if you either dealt with the fire with dart, before it explodes, it's much easier to deal with. That's how you deal with sin and temptation. You deal with it when it's in its seeds form and not when it's full grown, because now you've got a mess on your hands. And now it's more difficult. So you dip your faith in the Spirit of God. And so that way when the darts come, it won't even phase you. And you've seen some of those old, um, old movies where they all had the shields up and they're all lined up. And what are they doing? Taking a step forward. 
take a step forward. So you got your shield of faith, and you got your shield of faith, and I got my shield of faith. We can advance the kingdom of God, and everything the devil throws at us won't work. It won't work. It won't work. Because by God's grace, we have already been given the victory. Hallelujah. So we have the shield of faith. 17, and take the helmet of salvation. The iron helmet was forged from one piece of metal and lined with leather. Crest made of dyed horsehair indicated a rank. Uh, plates hung down along the cheek, and another plate uh, protected the back of the neck and shoulders. And so this protected the head. And so here is where we don't want to doubt God. Satan wants us to doubt God and our salvation. The helmet protects our mind from doubting God's saving power. The assurance of God's salvation protects the believers, just as the helmet protects a soldier in battle. And so here is where we want salvation is the helmet, right? So the salvation that God provided is what keeps our minds protected. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So the salvation is our hope. It's our promise in the inheritance. And so we have to continue to keep that on because the enemy wants you to doubt your faith. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword was carried on the right side and hung from the belt of a leather strap over the shoulder. A powerful offensive weapon in the hand of a skilled soldier, waving it served as a word warning the enemy. So this weapon helps believers proclaim the gospel message, act on God's behalf, and combat attacks from the devil. Paul's use of the Greek word rhema here primarily refers to the proclamation of the gospel and its ongoing work in the life of the believer. So this sword had a dual purpose. So you use the word of God to preach the gospel. That's your offensive swipe of the sword. But at the same time, that same word keeps you protected also. So it can be used on offense and on defense. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That's the rhema word. That's the spoken word. That's the preached word. And in Philippians 2, 12, uh, I want to look at the B clause here. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so we have this weapon where we go out and spread the word of God. And that same word that we preach to others, we use it to protect ourselves as well. And so that's the dual nature of the sword. Now, that's the armor. Verse 18, uh, some commentary says that prayer could have been the seventh armor. Because prayer is that place where we get strategies ourselves. Prayer is that glue that holds everything else together. So verse 18 says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And Paul says, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So prayer is so key. Prayer is what keeps us alert. Paul says that in several places. We saw it in 1 Peter. We see it here. Paul says that we have to be alert. That's part of us being balanced, right? We are alert. We're not looking for a fight with the enemy, but we don't run from it either. So it's that prayer that keeps us alert. It's that prayer that causes us to have discernment so that when the enemy comes, we can identify it and deal with it. Or say, hey, you know what? That's not the enemy. That's just our sinful nature or whatever it is. So that prayer is so key uh, as we begin to walk out this warfare of the believer. And then finally, Paul ends with his final greeting. He says, so that you may also know that, uh, how I am and what I am doing uh, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God, the Father of the, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Now that 
is the end of Ephesians chapter 6 and the entire book. If God spoke anything to you this evening, give your God a praise. Hallelujah. Now, there is a doctrine called common grace. Common grace is God being good to everybody, saint or sinner. And this common grace is important because if the devil had his way, he'd have wiped us all out. So unbelievers have no armor. Unbelievers are exposed and unprotected to the devices of the enemy. But because of God's common grace, he still kept you. He's still been good to you. And the Bible says it is the goodness of the Lord that leads to repentance. And so if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're not going to end this service without giving you an opportunity. If you're watching online or if you're here in this building, we're going to repeat a prayer calling on to God, asking him to come into your heart and to save you so that you can be equipped with the armor of God. Amen. So just repeat after me if this is you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and that you were raised from the dead with all power in your hand. And today, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Lord, forgive me for all of my sins. Holy Spirit, come into my life and shape me and mold me into the person you have called me to be. And today, Lord, I am a soldier in the army of the Lord. And I put on your armor because now it fits. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. To God be the glory.